My uh, brief was to talk about chemo radiation um, in oral cavity cancer. And when I saw the brief, there was about four speakers all pretty much speaking the same thing. So I said, no, this is too boring. I'm going to change my topic to the um, devil in the detail of uh, chemo radiation in oral cavity cancer. Because I think people talk about chemotherapy and radiotherapy as if it's the same everywhere in a completely universal uh, treatment delivery. We know from our Head Start study and also from the recent publication from the RTOG uh, study on centre and volume that there's a 20% difference in outcomes in uh, head and neck cancer patients treated in a big centre compared to little centres. 20% difference in overall survival. Yes. So I think that's huge. And then I was trying to really delve into some of the detail of why this might be the case. You know, usually we're aiming for a 10% difference with all different uh, treatment regimen comparisons in randomised control trials. So, but that's actually not the focus of my talk, I guess, in this today. Um, tomorrow is my talk is really trying to look at uh, details of radiotherapy and details of chemotherapy. So for example, um, post-operative radiotherapy is, is indicated in certain conditions like close, close margins and yet there is no consensus in surgery for what constitutes a close margin. If you look at the RTOG uh, trials that were published in the New England Journal in 2010 now, I think, they used a close margin as um, uh, uh, right up to the edge of the um, uh, specimen, whereas the EORTC used less than five millimetres. So such an important topic in head and neck cancer, you've got no consensus. Uh, similarly, in chemotherapy, people um, talk about that as it's a uniform uh, treatment, but there's a lot of variation in uh, the delivery of chemotherapy and the intensity of chemotherapy. And again, even though the patient may be planned to have uh, three cycles of chemotherapy with their radiotherapy. In 60% um, you know, of cases, they, that's, they only get two, for example. So I think there's a lot of variation in these sort of details that may be important. Also in radiotherapy, there's a lot of um, differences in technique. Um, for example, in the oral cavity, you can uh, treat but unilaterally or bilaterally, and the doses vary and, and techniques vary, and I think all those factors can be important and often they're too subtle to test in a uh, controlled trial and of course in, a, in many important aspects of medicine there's no funding. Trials have become so expensive. If you just want to look at a very useful basic clinical question, for example comparing high dose cisplatin in weeks one, four and seven with weekly cisplatin, the latter is used commonly because it's less toxic the total dose of cisplatin given over the period of time is the same and yet there, there won't be a trial done on that because cisplatin is an old drug and there's no pharma um, money for it. So I think that's another concern in, in clinical trials is that the trials get done to some extent dictated by the, um, the, pharma, you know, the pharmaceutical companies and I think that's something we've really got to be very strong about having investigator driven trials. Yeah, well, I think that's, that's clearly um, a cleaner product in a sense, but it's, it, the funding's tight everywhere and getting tighter. Trials, I think, are way too complex. If you look at the difference in a protocol now compared to 15 years ago, it, 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 there are, just the volume of them is about six times as great. So I think the pendulum has to swing back a little bit to being uh, not as complicated and not as expensive. And I think we have to just work better with the pharmaceutical companies that, you know, they're a great resource, um, but we've, we've got, we can find common goals uh, to a common end without compromising our scientific integrity, I think. I think a lot of, um, a lot of the time you need collaboration. I think often um, an important question is uh, too difficult to answer in one centre, in any one centre. And so by linking up with other centres, you can get the answer much faster. And so I think the collaboration between centres is important and that should be easier now in the, the techno technological world we live in, um, that we can, you know, someone has a good idea and other centres can join in to answer 
the question more quickly and more efficiently. And sometimes that may just be uh, a prospective study rather than a randomised control study, but just looking at a prospective study, and particularly in institutions who uh, have a very different uh, practice. Um, for example, it, at ASCO, um, um, there was a presentation on the UK trial of uh, planned nectar section versus observation after PET CT. Now we've, we've um, we wouldn't have been able to participate in that study because we've been doing that for the last decade and so we haven't been doing planned nectar section. So uh, that that's, was great that that study was done but it just highlights I think the different practices that evolve and whilst that was wonderful to have a randomised control trial confirming what we do, for example, um, there are many other areas where you may not get a randomised control trial up and running, but you can still get useful scientific information from prospective databases, really. Head and neck cancer is complex, it's not common, and it should be uh, centralised in big head and neck uh, cancer centres. And the smaller centres should have a link to them so that uh, there can be appropriate triaging of cases that can be treated locally versus those that should be treated at bigger centres.